Donald Trump this morning taking on Boeing, which has a deal in place to build a new Air Force One program. Trump tweeted out today that the new plane for Air Force One is too expensive. Then he stopped to talk to reporters at Trump Tower, and here's what he said. Watch this moment. Well, the plane is totally out of control. It's going to be over $4 billion. It's for Air Force One program. And uh, I think it's ridiculous. I think Boeing is doing a little bit of a number. We want Boeing to make a lot of money, but not that much money. Okay, thank you. Sit up and take notice, Boeing, right? Uh, good morning. Guy Benson is the political editor for townhall.com. Richard Fowler, Democratic strategist and radio talk show host. Both are Fox News contributors. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to have you with us this morning. morning. You know, so interesting to watch Donald Trump in action because what we're learning here is that none of these off the cuff comments are off the cuff at all. He walked in, walked over to the reporters. They asked him one sort of general question about who was coming through today. He said, yeah, they're all great. And then he waited for the reporter who was going to pipe up and say, hey, what about that tweet that you mentioned this morning about Boeing? And then he delivered the message that he no doubt walked into that lobby to deliver guy. What does this signal in your mind? Yeah, the tweet and then waiting for the question, obviously deliberate and planned. And I think it's just fascinating to watch him at work on some of this stuff because some people say, as you suggested, like, oh my gosh, maybe it's just completely flying by the seat of his pants, which may be the case in, in a number of circumstances, but not in this one. And I think what's particularly interesting about what he's done here is he's taking one relatively small line item that is a rounding error in the federal budget, but it's one that involves spru uh, sprucing up a plane that he's going to fly on, right? This is something that sort of benefits him. It reminds me of him saying he doesn't want to take a presidential salary. And he's sending a message, not just to Boeing, saying, hey, if, if this is getting a little over budget, let's right. rein it back in. He talked a lot about, you know, being under budget and ahead of schedule on the campaign trail and his private sector stuff. He wants to transfer that yeah. over uh, to his job as president. And I think that he's also sending a message to voters saying, I'm going to keep an eye out for right. you and your pocketbook, even when it would benefit me, a huge program like this. You know, but when you dig into this, there, there's even more here. And, and that was the case with the carrier situation as well. So he used the carrier jobs, which was, you know, great for those 1,100, however many people were affected and their jobs were saved, Richard. Um, but it goes back to United Technologies, which is a defense contractor for the United States government. Now here, when you dig into this Boeing comment on Air Force One, there is another deal that has been in the world works to move the construction of F-16 fighter jets to India, and that's a Boeing project as well. And you look back at something that, uh, that President-elect Trump said a month ago, and I want to quote this. He said, we're living through the greatest jobs theft in the world. He said that American companies have laid off workers and moved jobs to India, Singapore, and Mexico. India, Singapore, Mexico. So watch those countries. It's getting worse and worse and worse. So. Um, this is fascinating because he may also be after that project movement as well, Richard. Well, I think you're right, Martha. And it, this is the kind of type of Donald Trump that me as a Democrat can live with. A Donald Trump that goes out there and says, this is a bad deal for the American people, and guess what? As president, I won't let that go through. So I think this is good. And I think you, to speak to your next point is the idea that we are making our military weapons overseas is shocking, uh, and Boeing should be ashamed of themselves, and maybe Donald Trump is the one that holds them accountable. But that was an Obama-sanctioned... Uh, uh, project. They feel that it, it, it improves the relationship with India to have those fighter jets made in India, Richard. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I don't think it, it's still not a good deal. I mean, I was one of the few Democrats that were against the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership because I thought it was bad for the American worker. Uh, and Hillary Clinton said the same thing. But this is why, you know, it, when you think about this election, you do a post-mortem and you talk to folks in Ohio or you talk to folks in Wisconsin or in Macomb County in Michigan, this is why they voted for somebody like Donald Trump. Not that I agree with all of his policies, but he feels as though what he did today was he talked to them. He said, listen, $4 billion for a plane that already works pretty well, uh, it seems to be a waste of money when that money could go into funding America's infrastructure. Now, what I hope Democrats will do is, one, they need to hold Donald Trump accountable, but two, when this infrastructure bill comes to the, comes to the Congress, which it will in the next couple of weeks when he's president, I, Democrats should support it, but they should say, listen, let's do this in a way that truly works for the American people. Let's work with labor unions to make it a reality. Let's no, work and make sure we're employing minority contractors. Yeah. So that's where I think Donald Trump could actually make some ground up here with a lot of Democrats who are depressed mm -hmm. and demoralized from the Hillary Clinton de defeat. Great point, Richard. Uh, we'll see if that's how it plays out. Guy and Richard, thank you very much. Good
he is an elector, part of our electoral college, and uh, he does not want to go the way his state went. Uh, Texas Republican elector Chris Suffren now saying that uh, he will not go along with, as his state voters did, Donald Trump. Uh, Chris, very good to have you. Why? Thank you, Neil. Why no Donald Trump? Yeah. Uh, well, I think I answered that in my op-ed yesterday. He fails a three-point test that the founders established for us. Number one, we had uh, multiple generals and foreign policy experts, I believe 50, who said Donald Trump would be dangerous if he were president. Two, he continues to divide the nation, attacking the First Amendment, the Constitution, uh, spending more time ca attacking the Saturday Night Live cast than he does attending his daily intelligence briefings. And while those are both subjective concerns, objectively, you can look, and based on the Emoluments Clause, Mr. Trump fails that test given his uh, financial dealings well, that he won't disclose. That's your opinion and you're entitled to your opinion, but in your state, Donald Trump won 52.2% to 43.2%. Aren't you obligated to reflect the will of voters in Texas? Uh, that is not how the system was set up by the founders. The Electoral College is designed to be a safety check if electors are not comfortable with a candidate running. So you're with not a comfortable or somebody who you would prefer, I believe, John Kasich if you had your druthers, right? The Ohio governor. I'm not sure. It's hard. Someone like John Kasich, perhaps. I, I've got to be honest. I didn't hey. vote for John Kasich in the primary, and he wasn't really in my top three choices. But you I did like, like Donald with... Trump originally. What changed? I don't know about like. I, I've been reluctantly hopeful that he would fulfill his campaign promises and become more presidential, and that he would also release his tax returns, disclose his financial dealings. But instead, he became what we're hearing president. Our news... He was elected president. He got 306 electoral votes. Uh, are there others who feel as you do, and are they in sufficient numbers to deny him the 270 electoral votes he needs? Are there 36 others like you that you think would feel the same way? That's a better question for you than me. I have no idea. I am one person who wants to be comfortable with my decision on December 20th as well as December 19th. And right now, I cannot vote for Donald Trump and be comfortable with it after the fact. But you wouldn't vote for that Hillary test. Clinton, right? I mean, you would express if, if the idea had been a Republican, you would prefer a Republican. Without question, I am in a deliberation stage. I am looking for a Republican, preferably with both executive and legislative experience. But no disrespect to Secretary Clinton, I will not be voting for her. I understand she won the popular vote. The people who are tweeting me saying, hey, this is a great op-ed, now vote for Mrs. Clinton. I'm sorry, that will not happen. Uh, I'm going to choose another Republican who I Do think is qualified. Do you think that's fair to the voters in your state, though, and those in all these other states that electorally gave Mr. Trump a significant victory? Well, I'm not sure what a significant victory is. I think he lost you the popular all vote. You're Fox right. News. But he won the electoral vote with 306 electoral votes. He did, and the question is always, the question that keeps getting sent to me is, do I represent Texas or do I represent the congressional district that went four to one in favor mm -hmm. of Hillary? So you're so, going to continue this. This won't change on the 19th. You don't know who you will vote for, but it's not going to be Donald Trump. I'm in a deliberative stage. All right. Very good having you, Chris Superin, the Thank Texas you. Republican elector. The question is, how many like him are there? Donald Trump would need 36 others who are similarly minded. After eight years of a relationship that at times was strained with the Obama administration, some Israelis believe things will improve when Donald Trump moves into the White House. There is cautious optimism among Israelis regarding Trump's foreign policy. I think most officials in Israel right now are breathing a sigh of relief that we have less than 50 days of uh, the Obama administration left. Boosting confidence in Trump, his criticism of the Iran deal. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said he will raise the subject. As far as... Uh... President-elect Trump, I look forward to speaking with him about what to do about this bad deal. Another welcome sign, Trump's call to relocate the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to the disputed capital, Jerusalem. Trump's election of South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley as U.N. Ambassador is also seen as a positive development for Israel. Haley opposes economic boycotts against the Jewish state. Journalist Ari Kahana sees the Trump administration as a chance to improve overall U.S. relations. Israel has a strategic uh, opportunity to use this new administration, new uh, president with so positive uh, attitude towards Israel. 
Despite his really optimism, there are some worries. His selection of Steve Bannon as senior advisor raised the ire of some groups because of Bannon's association with Breitbart.com, a website the Anti-Defamation League described as the, quote, leading source for the extreme views of a vocal minority who peddle bigotry and promote hate. The ADL also said, quote, we are not aware of any anti-Semitic statements by Bannon himself. Trump's pick for defense secretary, retired General James Mattis, has warned that Israel's settlement policy is an obstacle to peace. Some Israelis are also concerned about Trump's unconventional style. This person has proved himself to be really unpredictable. I've never seen any leader like that. There is also uncertainty about the U.S. role in negotiating a final peace settlement. Trump has suggested involvement of an observant Jewish businessman, Jared Kushner, who has no experience in diplomatic affairs. Kushner is the president-elect's son-in-law. In New York, David Lee Miller, Fox News. General James Mattis, Mr. Trump's pick for defense secretary. An opportune time for Mattis to speak as the event will be held near Fort Bragg. In the meantime, Mr. Trump is starting off the day with more meetings at Trump Tower, including one with ExxonMobil CEO Rex Tillerson, a possible Secretary of State nominee. We have Fox team coverage. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel live on Capitol Hill, where both Vice President Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Mike Pence are making appearances today. But first, Senior National Correspondent John Roberts is live in Fayetteville. North Carolina, Fort Bragg, home of the 82nd Airborne, with the latest on the Trump transition. Hey, John. Greg, good afternoon to you. Should be a big event here in Fayetteville for Donald Trump tonight. Very heavy military area, and he thought that this would be the perfect place to unveil the official announcement for his pick for Secretary of Defense, General James Mattis. Of course, General Mattis, because he's only been retired from the military for three years now, needs a special waiver from Congress, and uh, House and Senate Republicans are working on the best way to get that done so that there's no hiccup in his confirmation process. At the same time, and Melissa mentioned this, that he is about to announce as Secretary of Defense, Donald Trump broadening out his search for Secretary of State. We were told last week he was down to four finalists, but he continues to meet with new people. He met with John Bolton last Friday. Today he's meeting with ExxonMobil President and CEO Rex Tillerson, an indication that Donald Trump is willing to look outside of the political and military fields to fill out his cabinet uh, positions for things like top diplomat. And at the same time that he's doing that, the Trump transition team continuing to get questions about that call that he took from the Taiwanese president, uh, Sighing when a couple of days ago this morning, Mike Pence, his running mate, said Donald Trump is fully aware of the long-standing one-China policy. Here he is. We have a unique relationship with that country that's been defined over the decades since we reopened uh, relations uh, with uh, the People's Republic of China. But um, but I think he I think he felt it would be, it would be rude not to uh, not to take the call. And, and, and the intrigue over how this all happened deepened a little bit last night when former senator and presidential candidate from 1996, Bob Dole, said that his law firm, Alston and Byrd, likely had something to do with arranging that phone call because Alston and Byrd does work for the Taipei Cultural and Economic Development Office. We're not sure what this all means at this point, Greg. It could mean nothing, could be just a courtesy, or it could be an indication of a slight shift in policy toward China. We'll see. Yeah, Greg? Bit of a mystery, but uh, the talk of the morning seemed to have been Mr. Trump trying to clip the wings of the Air Force One project, right? Yeah, a little while ago, the Air Force asked Boeing to come up with uh, some research and development for a couple of new copies of the plane that has been ferrying the president around since uh, Bush 41 back in 1990. But when Donald Trump caught wind of what that program was going to cost, he sent out a tweet this morning suggesting he might put the kibosh on it. Here's what he said, quote, Boeing is building a brand new 747 Air Force One for future president, but costs are out of control more than $4 billion. Cancel order, exclamation point. And here's what he told the presidential transition press pool this morning. The plane is totally out of control. It's going to be over $4 billion. It's for Air Force One program. And uh, I think it's ridiculous. I think Boeing is doing a little bit of a number. We want Boeing to make a lot of money, but not that much money. <laughs> 
Boeing fired back this afternoon, quote, we are currently under contract for $170 million to help determine the capabilities of these complex military aircraft that serve the unique requirements of the President of the United States. We look forward to working with the U.S. Air Force on subsequent phases of the program, allowing us to deliver the best planes for the President at the best value for the American taxpayer. And we should tell you that so far they've only got into some, some uh, initial research and development, some engineering. No airframes have been built yet, so it's not like they've got a plane uh, uh, that's ready to take off that he's saying he doesn't want. Not unprecedented either, Greg. You might remember back in 2009, uh, the, uh, the the military, the uh, Marines were supposed to take delivery of 28 new Marine One type helicopters when the cost of that program ballooned from $6 billion to over $13 billion. Uh, President Obama canceled it. it was just one final note, too, Greg. Uh, Donald Trump did hold some shares in Boeing, but we understand from his campaign that he sold those shares a while ago, sold all of his shares in all companies. Back in June, uh, Donald Trump has said he's never been a huge fan of stocks, and while his portfolio may be substantially larger than yours or mine, probably doesn't <laughs> represent a huge percentage of his total holdings, right? Yeah, it's a small percentage, but for you and me, pal, wow, that'd be some <laughs> cash. Oh, I'd be living easy. Yeah, oh, be yeah, be, easy be, street. Be living easy in some remote <laughs> island somewhere, yeah. Thanks, Greg. Uh, all right, John Roberts, John, thanks. Do you want to witness America become great again? It'll cost you. President-elect Donald Trump appears to be opening the inauguration gates to the highest rollers. The Trump inaugural committee has released several package deals for those who wish to be part of the five festivity-filled January days in Washington. Gifts range from $25,000 to $1 million as packages increase in cost with more exclusive access, events, and the amount of tickets. At $25,000, donors get two tickets to the inaugural parade, the victory reception, admission to the inaugural concert and fireworks show, as well as a black tie inaugural ball with special appearances by Trump, wife Melania, and Vice President-elect Mike Pence and wife Karen. The next level for $100,000, donors receive four tickets for those events, plus two tickets for an intimate policy discussion and dinner with select cabinet appointees. A $250,000 check will get you all that, plus admission for two to the ladies' luncheon, where you get to meet the ladies of the first families, including Melania and Trump's daughter, Ivanka, plus an elegant candlelight dinner with special appearances by Trump and Pence. At $500,000, you receive four tickets to each event, but that's not all. Starting at the $500,000 price point, donors will have an intimate dinner with Pence and wife Karen. And only for a million dollars, donors will receive eight tickets for the majority of the events, four tickets to have dinner with Pence and Karen, plus attendance to an exclusive luncheon with select cabinet appointees and House and Senate leadership. The overall cost of the inauguration and related festivities is likely to run as much as $200 million. According to several people involved in the planning efforts, the inaugural committee hopes to raise roughly $65 million to $75 million to fund all of the events surrounding the culmination of the future president of the United States. Trump is not expected to donate to the festivities himself, as he did for his presidential campaign. Most of the burden and cost will fall on taxpayers. For FoxNews.com, I'm Rob Demetrius. Donald J. Trump to be the next president of the United States. He's tapped to be President-elect Trump's closest advisor on the most sensitive threats facing the nation. And tonight, there is growing criticism that his inflammatory views make him unfit for the job. More than 50 progressive nonprofits, ranging from religious to social justice organizations, signed a letter asking Trump to dump Flynn. Islam is a political ideology. It is a political ideology. It, it definitely hides behind this, I, this notion of it being a religion. Citing the former defense intelligence chief's numerous Islamophobic remarks, including tweeting in February that fear of Muslims is rational. Today, Vice President-elect Mike Pence praised Flynn on CNN. We are so grateful and honored uh, to have General Flynn uh, as our nominee for national security advisor. He brings an extraordinary wealth of experience. Michael Flynn. But the groups also raise more substantive allegations. On one occasion, while overseeing intelligence in Afghanistan, former government officials tell CNN that Flynn shared classified information from another agency with Pakistan. Flynn told CNN the allegation, quote, is not true, not even close. But the incident led to an informal reprimand, though no charges, officials tell CNN. 
And even as Flynn received classified intelligence briefings during the campaign, he was lobbying on behalf of foreign clients, among them Turkey, who Flynn has uncritically backed as it has cracked down on domestic dissent. Trump's transition team told CNN last month that Flynn's dealings with Turkey were within his rights as a private citizen and that Flynn would sever ties to his consulting firm when he is part of the administration. I've had people in the media, mainstream media, that have said, oh, it's, that's all a conspiracy, it's a lie. In his public statements, Flynn has repeatedly dabbled in conspiracy theories. Just one week before the election, he tweeted, quote, you decide, NYPD blows whistle on new Hillary emails, money laundering, sex crimes with children, etc. must read, end quote, allegations that remain entirely unsubstantiated. Flynn's son, Michael Flynn Jr., who served as his aide, has been a leading proponent of a bizarre fake news story alleging that a D.C. pizzeria was home to a child sex ring visited by Clinton campaign staff. The story led an armed man to enter the restaurant this weekend, he claimed, to investigate the allegations. He was arrested only after firing several shots. And yet on Sunday, Flynn Jr. was still defending the conspiracy theory, tweeting, quote, until Pizzagate proven to be false, it'll remain a story. The left seems to forget Podesta emails and the many coincidences tied to it. Today, Flynn Jr. was dismissed from the transition. The decision, sources tell CNN, coming directly from the president-elect. Election day was four weeks ago today. That's hard Congra to Congratulations. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very humbling. It's, uh, it's hard to believe it's already been four weeks, but in many ways, it, for all the progress we've made in the course of this transition, which is moving at a historic and a record pace, I mean, this transition actually is now... It's been certified that we're, we're, President-elect Trump is moving faster than, than any president-elect has in naming cabinet officials for the last 40 years. It's exciting to be a part of it. So let's talk about uh, the number one item on, on the news right now, which is um, the president-elect starting uh, to talk about canceling uh, the Boeing contract. That's how he began his day. Uh, take a listen. Well, the plane is totally out of control. It's going to be over $4 billion. It's for Air Force One program. And uh, I think it's ridiculous. I think Boeing is doing a little bit of a number. We want Boeing to make a lot of money, but not that much money. Now, there's no question that there should be more oversight over these contracts. But I guess critics are wondering, is this the best way to do it? The president's like said that. The uh, Boeing stock took a, took a big hit. It's, it's rebounded, but it took a big hit uh, before uh, the markets opened. It's an American company, the biggest exporter in the United States. Uh, it employs 150,000 people, most of them in this uh, country. Uh, for, I guess the first question is, where does the $4 billion figure come from? Because that's confusing a lot of people. Well, I think it, the General Accounting Office uh, certified it north of $3 billion, and it's a, it's a contract that can grow. The uh, president-elect uh, is demonstrating today what uh, the American people hired as our next president, a uh, businessman that knows how to sharpen his pencils. And uh, no sooner did he hear about a $4 billion contract for a couple of new installments of Air Force One that he said, uh, we should cancel the contract, put a hold on it. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Donald Trump's a man who's bought a few airplanes. He's still got a few airplanes. <laughs> and uh, he's going to be uh, he's going to be a real champion for taxpayers and for fiscal responsibility. And this is uh, this is just the first installment. Would you call that the bully pulpit, even though he isn't the uh, the president yet? I mean, using the bully pulpit to, to send a signal to a company? I I think you could call it. Uh, the bully pulpit uh, on behalf of fiscal responsibility, not a message to a particular company. It's, it's uh, uh, look, uh, what, what you have, and I saw it last week in Cincinnati for the thank you rally. He'll be in North Carolina uh, tonight. Uh, I'll be traveling with him later this week as someone who's going to go straight to the American people with his priorities. He's going to go straight to the American people with our agenda. And uh, I was on Capitol Hill today meeting with members of the Senate uh, and I told them that, remember, as we lay out this aggressive agenda for that first 100 days on Capitol Hill, they're going to have uh, in a inaugurated President Donald Trump someone who is not just going to go to Capitol Hill to drive his agenda. He's going to go to the American people and he's going to marshal the support of the American people to drive forward an agenda to make America great again. I want to ask you uh, about an incident on the transition today. Michael G. Flynn, the son of the future National Security Advisor, Lieutenant General Michael Flynn, has been pushing a bunch of conspiracy theories, including one 
uh, that ended up uh, impacting your, where you're staying right now, your local pizza place, Comet Pizza. Um, an insane lie spread online. Uh, it led a North Carolina man to, to barge into the restaurant with, with, with two weapons. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Now, Flynn Jr. Uh, was on the transition team, but a source familiar with the situation tells me that he was asked to leave um, and that the direct order came from President-elect Trump. Tell me what happened. Well, what, what I can say is that we are so grateful and honored uh, to have General Flynn uh, as our nominee for National Security Advisor. He brings an extraordinary wealth of experience. Uh, he's also a dedicated family man. Uh, and uh, I said this morning that uh, his son had no involvement in the transition, but I've talked to General Flynn, and, and his son was helping him a bit with scheduling and administrative items, but that's no longer the case. Look, all, all of our families uh, want to be helpful, uh, and four weeks to the day uh, from Election Day, there's been an awful lot of work to do, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, Mike Flynn Jr. is no longer uh, associated with General Flynn's efforts or with the transition team, and uh, we're focused eyes forward. You, you're downplaying his role, but you must be aware that the transition team put in for security clearance for Michael G. Flynn, the son of Lieutenant General Flynn. Well, I, I'm, I'm aware in talking to General Flynn that, that uh, his son was helping with scheduling, Jake. His, his, uh, no, but you put in for security he, clearance he was, for him. He was helping his dad arrange for meetings and provide meetings, but that's no longer the case. But and, do you need security uh, clearance to, to do scheduling? I think that's the appropriate decision for us to move forward, avoid any further distraction, and uh, uh, I'm very confident as we continue to build this team. Um, uh, and uh, as uh, tonight, you'll see the president-elect formally announce uh, uh, General Mattis as the new uh, secretary of the Department uh, of Defense that uh, the American people are going to be impressed uh, with the way that the president-elect is, is uh, bringing together men and women that are make, make America safe again. I want to move on to other issues, but I'm afraid I just didn't get an answer, which is were you aware that the transition had put in for a security clearance for Michael Flynn, Jr. You know, I've worked very closely with General Flynn. We've met on many occasions. I've, I've never, I've never uh, seen his son present for any of those meetings. In but you're head of the transition but, team, so you know who General, you put in for security clearances well, for. Well, Gen General Flynn did inform me that his son was helping on administrative matters. But, but Jake, this is all the kind of distraction that, that, frankly, I know, with all due respect, the national media likes to go chasing after. I think what the American people are impressed by, and it's a reason why, frankly, you see, you see public opinion uh, uh, on the rise about the president-elect in the last four weeks is because they're seeing the kind of decisive leadership that Donald Trump is bringing to this transition. It's the kind of energetic leadership that's going to focus on the priorities of the American people, building a team, building a legislative agenda, driving our nation forward to a stronger, more prosperous America. The last question on this, sir, and I'm sorry, it's just, you're not answering the question, which is, were you aware that the transition team had put in for a security clearance? I mean, this is a young man who had a social media profile that had all sorts of crazy conspiracy theories, that had all, sort of lost all sorts of links and retweets with white supremacists. Were you aware that the transition put in for a security clearance for him? Well, what I can tell you is that in, in talking with General Flynn today, he made me aware that his son uh, was assisting him uh, in scheduling and that you put in for a security meetings plans. and uh, well, whatever the appropriate paperwork was to assist him in that regard, Jake, I'm sure was taking place. But that's no longer the case, uh, and your viewers and the American people can be confident that we're going to we're going to continue to drive forward. Look, this is a very challenging time for America's place in the world. It was a week ago yesterday that we saw a terrorist-inspired attack uh, on the Ohio State campus. Uh, uh, we're bringing together uh, with, uh, with General Mike Flynn, with uh, KT McFarland, uh, with a team that, that's going to surround them uh, and advise this president, uh, people that are going to set into motion, I'm confident, uh, the policies that'll, that'll make America safe again at home and abroad. And it was just two days ago that we saw somebody with a gun go to Comet Pizza because of this crazy conspiracy theory that Michael G. Flynn had been putting out there, defended afterwards, and... You guys put in for security clearance. But I will move on because I want to talk about Obamacare. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said today that Obamacare, they'd start the process of trying to repeal it on day one. Uh, House Speaker Paul Ryan has said it would probably take about three years to come up with a replacement. Is that good enough for you? Uh, President-elect Trump says repeal and replace. Is repeal now, replace three years later? Is that okay? Or do you want to see a change in that timeline? Well, let me say the first thing we're going to do, and the President-elect has indicated this to the leaders of the House and Senate is we're going to keep our promise to the American people and we're going to repeal Obamacare lock, stock and barrel. But what we're also going to do is work with members of the House and Senate 
to ensure an orderly transition. Uh, and the, the length of time that that will take will be a subject of legislative debate, uh, and, and we'll fill in the substance of that. We're also prepared, as I told members of the Senate today, Jake, uh, the president-elect is prepared on day one to put into effect uh, the kind of administrative action that will ensure that that transition happens uh, on an orderly basis. But we've got to take action. I mean, the truth is Obamacare right now is scheduled to increase premiums by an average of 25% all across this country, putting a, an enormous weight on American families and American businesses. Uh, in Arizona alone, premiums are scheduled to go up an average of 116%. Uh, we're going to use uh, the vehicle of a budget resolution right out of the box, uh, and we're going to repeal Obamacare, and we're going to set into motion the kind of orderly process that will address the health care needs of this country, harnessing the power of the free market, giving consumers more choices in health insurance. But All then, of the kind of ideas that the president-elect talked about as a candidate, we're going to keep those promises once he takes a seat in the Oval Office. For those who can't afford health insurance and who only have it because of the Medicaid expansion, which you know well because of uh, being the governor of Indiana, mm -hmm. and also because of the stipends, what should they expect during this transition period? Will their Medicaid expansion stay there? Well, I, I would anticipate that um, a, a part of what we will do is what the president-elect has called for through the course of the campaign. And that is while we, while we take the mandate off every American that exists under Obamacare, the threat of higher taxes against individuals and businesses, uh, we're going to develop a plan, a plan to block grant Medicaid back to the states so that states can do exactly what Indiana was able to do in part by reforming Medicaid. Uh, the state of Indiana, which President Lake and I have talked an awful lot about, actually has, Medicaid recipients can have health savings accounts to be able to, to have first dollar benefits. They make monthly contributions to those health savings accounts and, and, and they're given credit for preventive medicine and wellness. These are all the kind of market principles that states can innovate in Medicaid, and it's going to be part and parcel of our plan to replace Obamacare. Last question for you, sir, because I know you have a lot of meetings to do. Um, your son is a Marine. He is. You and your boss, more your boss, but with your advice and consent uh, and help, uh, will now be in charge of the lives of our men and women in uniform. I'm wondering, this will be the first time that you play a role like this, sending troops or, or helping uh, a president to send troops into battle or not send troops into battle. Um, and you'll be doing so as a dad who has a son in the Marines. And I'm just wondering how that might impact you um, sometimes generals, as they say, uh, the biggest doves in Washington are the ones with, their st with stars on their shoulders because they understand the sacrifice, and you, in a different way, will, will be able to understand it. How will it affect you, do you think? Well, Jake, I think it will affect me the way it affects every American when, uh, when we think about those decisions. And I think what people can take great comfort in, and when they see General Mattis take to that stage tonight um, as the nominee to be our the new leader at the Department of Defense, and they think about his extraordinary uh, background, they can be confident that they're going to have a president in Donald Trump who's going to rebuild our military and, and believes firmly that we will have peace through strength. A stronger America is a safer America. A stronger America is a safer and more stable world. But uh, I, I can tell you uh, that we'll also have a commander-in-chief uh, that will look at the lives of the men and women who serve in uniform as, well, they were his very own kids, and will approach those decisions, uh, I know he will, uh, with prayer and with reflection. But the objective is uh, to have an America strong enough with a rebuilt military, with our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guard able to have the resources and training to do their job uh, so that we don't ever have to ask them to fight. Vice President-elect Mike Pence from the great state of Indiana, thank you so much. Best of luck to you, sir. Thank Best you, of Jim. luck to you. Appreciate Good to it. See you.